This video is part of a four part series on thinking ahead. In this video, we discuss identifying inputs and outputs in a given situation. Thinking ahead is an essential skill. It will help you to maximize code efficiency and minimize errors. One of the first tasks when designing a new system is to determine what inputs the system needs and what outputs the system should produce. A typical approach is to start by deciding what your system needs to output. What is its goal? Most systems are designed to produce an output of some kind, whether it be visual on screen or printed in a physical format, audio, some form of haptic feedback, or data to be input into another process or system. Once you understand what your system does, you can backtrack and work out the inputs it will need to produce the desired outputs. For example, imagine a computer company that offers on-site repairs, upgrades and maintenance for a fixed cost per service. Here's an example of a digital invoice. This would be an output from a company system and could be generated automatically as part of an online ordering process. What inputs would need to go into the system in order to generate the data required to produce this automatic invoice? Pause the video and study the invoice and see if you can come up with a list. So hopefully you identified most of these data items on the invoice. Each of these would need to be input into the system in some form or another to end up producing the output in the form of the automatic PDF invoice. Now, in terms of writing a computer program, you need to be able to identify the inputs, processes and the outputs. Under exam conditions, this will usually relate to a provided scenario. So let's have a look at an easy scenario here. Write a program to calculate the volume of a fish tank based on its dimensions and report the results to the user. So you can see here, we would require the user to input the length, height and depth of the fish tank. Now this is assuming a sort of cube shaped um, fish tank, so it's quite a simple example. We then need to process that information times the length by the height times the depth and the output then would be a number, a real or float, the volume of the fish tank. Okay let's look at another example but this time you have a go. So we're going to write a program that asks the user for the number of students in their class and prompts them to enter each student's test score within the range 0 to 100. It should then output the highest, lowest and average score. So pause the video and figure out what are the inputs and outputs to this system and what processes have to happen to turn those inputs into the outputs. OK, so we've got here that we should input the number of students and obviously the current score will need to be input by each student. The output, literally from the scenario, should be the smallest score, min score, the max score and the average. And then obviously there's some processing in the middle to work out those values. And that's where your algorithm or your code would go. So having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. Why is it important to identify the inputs and outputs of a system? And what form can those inputs and outputs take? To help get your head around everything to do with computational thinking, we have a freely available downloadable cheat sheet. It's got two sides to it. There's a basic poster that reminds you at a top level what the five different strands are. And on the back, there's a much more detailed explanation. This resource is completely free from student.craigandave.org. Just scroll down and select the section that says A-level revision. You'll then see a section called OCR, AS and A-level, and there's a number of cheat sheets in there, including two versions of the computational one. Just click download to get the zip file.